Hello and welcome to Lockdown Embryology with me, Alice Roberts. Today we're covering the membranes that develop around the embryo and which will sustain the embryo during its development into a fetus, so forming its life support system while it's in the womb. But in fact, I'm not going to start off talking about human embryology. I'm going to start off looking at chick embryology, bird embryology, because a lot of the same structures are there and when it comes to the membranes we'll see those as well, but of course this time inside the egg. So I'm starting off by drawing the hen's reproductive tract, starting with the fat ovary at the top, a single ovary bulging with huge eggs, and then there's the infundibulum, the funnel-like entrance to the oviduct, and the oviduct itself leading down to the uterus or shell gland, where the egg will pause for a moment before being laid. So let's focus on just one egg that's being ovulated from that ovary. It is huge. It is the size of a yolk inside a normal chicken's egg, and, and that's what it is. It's, it is full of yolk. That's what the yellow is. But there's a little patch of DNA, and if it gets fertilised, that will start to develop into a blasto disc just at one side of that huge egg. You can see that blasto disc developing there and some blood vessels starting to form as well. And as that fertilised egg, which is already starting to develop, slips down the oviduct, it becomes covered in the egg white, the albumin, and then also the shell, which will protect it when it's laid. And at one end, just inside the shell, there's also an air space, so the air in there is exchanging with the air outside the egg. What I want to look at in detail are the membranes around that developing chick embryo. So here is that embryo getting bigger. It's got an amniotic membrane around it, so it's floating in amniotic fluid. And it's also attached to that enormous yolk sac full of yolk sac nutrients, yolk sac platelets, and that attaches through to its gut. There's also a protrusion of its gut, the allantois, which is lying up against the outer membrane around the developing embryo, the chorion, which I'm just illustrating on that one side of the egg just there. So if we label up these membranes, the inner one is the amnion and the outer one is the chorion. And that outpouching from the embryo's gut tube, the allantois, lies right up touching the chorion and actually fuses with that membrane to form the chorioallantoic membrane. And that membrane is really important because it becomes vascularized, full of blood vessels, and that's going to be the way that the chick exchanges gases with the air outside the egg. So you might not have thought about this before. How does a chick get hold of oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide inside its egg? But the secret to it is the chorioallanteric membrane. And the inside of the allantois is useful as well. That's somewhere that the chick can put some of the waste products of metabolism that it's making inside the egg. It has to have somewhere to get rid of those. So there we have it then, the developing chick embryo. Now we're going to switch and look at the developing human embryo and find lots of analogies with that developing chick and the membranes around it. So here's a little human embryo at about four weeks of development. And again, you can see that it is floating inside a bubble, a little pond of amniotic fluid. And it also has a yolk sac, even though actually that yolk sac is full of fluid rather than nutrients. It even has an allantois, but this is much, much smaller than it is in the chick. It's pretty much vestigial in the human. Let's label up the amnion then, which is enclosing the amniotic cavity, which is full of amniotic fluid that the developing embryo is swimming around in. Now I'm going to start labelling these outer layers, so the chorion, and at this point we call it the chorionic plate. Now that's made of extra embryonic mesoderm, which you might remember from some of the earlier lockdown embryology videos. And this image shows the embryo at about week four of development. Let's move on a couple of weeks and see what's happening in particular to all of those membranes around the embryo. So here's the embryo itself it's got a bit bigger there's the connecting stalk and the yolk sac which is getting squashed up against that connecting stalk 
the amniotic cavity has got bigger, it's starting to fill up and push into the chorionic cavity. And eventually, actually, it will obliterate that cavity and the amnion and the chorion will fuse together, just adding a label there to the connecting stalk, which you might remember will turn into the umbilical cord. And that's connecting the embryo to the outer membranes, including what becomes the placenta, which forms its life support system. So now we're speeding ahead another couple of weeks to week eight of human embryological development. And you can see the embryo is bigger and it's got arms and legs by this point. The amniotic cavity has massively expanded and it has squashed the chorionic cavity almost out of existence. The yolk sac has almost disappeared within the connecting stalk, which becomes the umbilical cord. Now I want to focus on what's really going on with these outer membranes and the formation of this all-important placenta, the life support system of the developing embryo. The placenta has a maternal component which comes from the endometrium, the lining of the womb, but then it also has this embryonic component, this fetal component, which is from the chorion, the extra embryonic mesoderm, but also the trophoblast, so the two layers of the trophoblast, the cytotrophoblast and the syncytia trophoblast. And what we can see here are villi, finger-like projections, projecting from the chorionic plate made of extra embryonic mesoderm. The stem villi reach all the way out to the edge, to the cytotrophoblast shell, and then there are free villi branching off from them into these spaces, the intervillous spaces, so the spaces between the villi. If we look at these villi as they develop, and we do a cross section through them, then we see that we've got a, a core of extra embryonic mesoderm, and then around that is a layer of cytotrophoblast, and then around that is a layer of syncytiotrophoblast, and those are projecting into those intervillar spaces which contain maternal blood. As those villi mature by the fourth month, the cytotrophoblast is thinned right down and is just there in patches. And so you've just got the endothelium of capillaries in the core of the villus and then the syncytium around the outside. And that's the barrier between fetal blood and maternal blood. So it's a very thin barrier, but nevertheless, it is a barrier. The fetal blood and the maternal blood are not going to mix together. Now I'm just going to put that embryo with its surrounding membranes in context inside the womb, inside the uterus, so we can see how that placenta is forming. So this image that I've just drawn is also week eight, but this time we're seeing the embryo inside the uterus. So there it is in its amniotic cavity. This is the part of the endometrium which is contributing to the placenta, the decidua basalis. There's some endometrium, a very thin layer of endometrium around the bump of the developing embryo in its amniotic cavity. That's the decidua capsularis. And then the decidua, the endometrium around the rest of the inside of the womb is the decidua parietalis. It's probably worth pausing for a moment just to think about those terms. So decidua is the term for endometrium during pregnancy. And the reason it's called decidua is because like a deciduous tree losing its leaves in autumn, this lining of the womb will be shed at birth. And then it's just described in relation to that developing fetus. So the decidua basalis, the basal decidua, is lying up against the fetal part of the placenta. So this is the maternal part of the placenta effectively. And then the decidua capsularis, the capsula part of the decidua, is lining the outside of the chorion, the outermost of the fetal membranes. Then we're left with the parietal decidua, which is lining the rest of the wall of the womb. So parietal means of the wall. Moving on another month, so to the end of the 12th week of development, then everything is growing. The uterus itself has increased in size. The the fetus, we now call it a fetus because we're past week eight, has increased in size and it's got decent little arms and legs and fingers and toes and lots of organs inside it. 
and we can see that the amniotic cavity now is really the only cavity that's left. It's expanded, it's obliterated the chorionic cavity completely, the amnion and the chorion are fused together. I'm just going to go back to that week eight image and label up the different parts of the chorion. So the part of the chorion that contributes to the placenta is very leafy, it's called the chorion frondosum. On the other side, the chorion has lost its villi and becomes smooth, it becomes the chorion levy. So that means by the time we get to this 12 weeks image, in fact we've got four layers fused together, the amnion, the chorion levy, the decidua capsularis and the decidua parietalis. And that placenta is going to grow and grow by term, by the time the baby's born. It's around 20 centimetres in diameter and weighs about half a kilogram. Now it's time to add some colour and perhaps pick out some more details as we do. There's the hen's reproductive tract that we started with and that ovary, which I'm colouring in with bright yellow because those ova really are that colour, as you know from looking at hen's eggs. And you can see that they're all different sizes and the bigger ones are just getting ready to ovulate out. So I'll also colour that egg bright yellow, that fertilised egg. And there's the blasto disc at the top there, which is equivalent to the germ disc in the human embryo, with some blood vessels starting to radiate out across the surface of the yolk sac. And then there's the chick embryo at a slightly later stage of development, floating in its amniotic sac and with its allantois up there fused to the chorion to form the chorioallantoic membrane. Moving on to the human embryo, I'm using the same colours and they are the colours I've used all the way through, so yellow for the gut tube and the attached yolk sac and the allantois which is also a diverticulum off the gut tube and there's the yolk sac by week eight which is relatively small and insignificant now because of course that human embryo is going to be getting its nutrition from the placenta, it's not getting it from a yolk. And I'm just adding a little bit of shading to the amniotic cavity and the chorionic cavity. There's the chorionic cavity, a little bit darker so you can differentiate it. And that of course is disappearing so that by the time we get to week eight, it's almost squashed out of existence by the growing amniotic cavity. And there's the amniotic cavity again at week eight, but this time in the context of the uterus and over there, week 12, so the end of the third month of development. And let's use another colour just to highlight the uterine cavity, which has pretty much been obliterated by the time we get to the third month, the end of the third month. Now I'm going to take some orange, that's the colour I've been using in previous videos for extra embryonic mesoderm. And that extra embryonic mesoderm forms a connecting stalk. It also forms the lining of the chorionic cavity, so the chorion itself. And on the side where you've got the placenta, it forms the chorionic plate and those villi. Those villi start off developing all round the outside of the chorion, in fact. So it's all leafy, but then they just get restricted to one side, the chorion frondosum, and that forms the fetal part of the placenta. And then the other side, the chorion is smooth, the chorion levy. I'm now using blue to paint in the cytotrophoblast layer, which expands out to form the cytotrophoblast shell, but is also lining those villi, which are projecting out from the chorionic plate. And then finally, the syncytiotrophoblast, that syncytial layer of cells, which is lining the outside of the villi. Now I'm painting in the spiral arteries of the uterus coming in and they are pouring blood into those intervillous spaces. So that's maternal blood coming in via those spiral arteries. And there it is in the intervillous spaces, the spaces between the villi. And then in the core of the villi are capillaries that are actually part of the fetal circulation. Those capillaries contain fetal blood which is exchanging with the maternal blood, picking up oxygen, getting rid of carbon dioxide and also picking up nutrients and getting rid of waste electrolytes as well. So those capillaries eventually resolve into the umbilical vein, carrying that nicely oxygenated blood into the embryo, the fetal body, and then we have two umbilical arteries 
bringing the blood back out to the placenta, eventually into these capillaries in the villi. So the villi start off with layers on the outside, the cytotrophoblast and the syncytiotrophoblast, and the cytotrophoblast thins down so that eventually the barrier between the maternal blood and the blood inside the capillaries is just a very thin placental barrier, the lining of the capillary, the endothelium of the capillary, and that syncytium by the fourth month in utero. Sticking with my orange for extra embryonic mesoderm, there's the chorion on those images with the fetus in situ inside the uterus. And now I'm just picking out the lining of the womb, the endometrium that forms the decidua during pregnancy in another colour and I've chosen green just to differentiate that. So that's the development of the, the membranes and the placenta of the human embryo with a bit of comparative embryology as well. I don't expect you'll ever look at a hen's egg in quite the same way again. Join me for the next lockdown embryology video where I'll be moving on to some of the organs inside that developing embryo. Do you like, do you share, do you subscribe to my YouTube channel? Check out Lockdown Anatomy as well. Thank you for watching.